One of the things that I really enjoyed growing up doing is going backpacking. And we would go and, you know, that's where you put all your things into a backpack. You put your, your tents, you put your sleeping bag, you put your food, you put your clothes, you put your water purifier, everything into your backpack and you leave the car. You leave the air conditioning, you leave all that stuff and you hike on the trail for six, seven, eight miles and to get to your spot and everything is on your back. So we would do all these backpacking trips. I remember growing up with, with my family and, and friends with the school. And uh, this particular backpacking trip, we went up to the Trinity Mountains up near Sacramento. And uh, we got to our spot and I began, I took my backpack off and I began to take my tent out and I started setting everything up. And as I was setting my tent up, I realized that I had forgotten something very important. The tent poles. And so I was, I was trying to figure out how am I going to set up this tent without the tent poles. And so I, I looked around, I found sticks, and I, I put shoelaces together, and I was going to make this, this strong pole with these sticks. And so I looked for the biggest, toughest, roundest sticks I could find to be my tent poles. But it didn't matter how many or how strong they were, they were not strong enough to keep up the tent. And so the, those sticks kept snapping left and right. They kept snapping. And I had, a, I had a, fr a friend who saw my issue. He saw the problem. And he came over to, to, to you know, try and help me. And he, he, he said, you know, what, what's going on? And I said, uh, my, tent, my tent won't stay up. And he said, you know what? I think, I think I got something for you. And so he went back to where he was sleeping. And he went to his bag and he found something he came back over and he he had an extra tent pole i don't know many people who bring extra stuff on a backpacking trip because they know they have to carry that that stuff in um, but he had an extra one and i was so thankful that he was willing to sacrifice his extra tent pole for me so that i could stay in in that tent and uh, sorry, Dad, that, that tent is ruined because of that trip. But <laughs> but that was that was so so I was so thankful that he had that, so I could I didn't have to sleep out in, with the mosquitoes, uh, and I could be on, inside the tent. You know, there are uh, lots of times when we run into situations where we have our options run out. We don't have any, we don't know what to do because there's no options and we have nowhere to go to, no place to turn. What do you do when every option ex is exhausted and you have nothing left? Uh, I remember going, to, I, I'm a graduate of Southwestern Adventist University and uh, we chose that university because it was the cheapest and they also had a good theology program, but primarily because it was the cheapest. And, uh, I remember every semester, the beginning of the semester, I, 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 I loved school growing up, uh, and I was always excited about new semesters because you get to choose what, what classes you would you know, get to, to attend and, and start. But uh, one of the reasons I was not so excited was the financial aid office. Because uh, I knew our, our family, we didn't have lots of, lots of funds. We would have to take out lots of loans and, and different things. And, uh, but I would always make my home in the financial aid office. Um, I, I got to know all of the officers there and all, every, all, the, all the receptionists at the financial aid office. And because how it would, how it would be is after uh, every, I would get up in the morning, get breakfast, go to my first class, and then I would go straight to the financial aid office and say, hey, what's new? Do we have any, anything you guys can help me out with today? And uh, that's, I spent my time there. They had they have a seven step program, and when you get to step seven, you're you're good. You don't have to be there for the rest of the semester. And I was there for at least the first four weeks uh, at the financial aid office. I remember it was our my either my my freshman or my sophomore year, and they had an awards banquet. And you know if you go to an awards banquet, that usually means because you did something really great that year. And I, I thought, there was no way I'm going to get invited to the awards banquet. 
But every year, I got I got invited to do awards banquet, and it was for all these all these scholarships. And they would have two, three, four, you know, different scholarships that they would give to people. And I remember they they gave me scholarships, and I was so 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 out out of my mind. I, I didn't even think I would ever receive one, but they would give me scholarships, and every year I would get scholarships to help with funding for to get through through college. I remember uh, a one year when Ashley has had a, had a roommate named Brenna, and she got a a letter, a an envelope from some like a strange man that she had met. Um, just walking on campus, and he came up to her and said, "Hey, give this to Dominic Ali Boone." And uh, Brandon and I, we, we hardly ever talked. The only reason we talked because we are friends of Ashley. And, and so she's like, "Oh, I, I know who that is." And so she gave it to me, and I opened it up, and it was the exact amount I needed to get past, you know, all of those financial aid steps. And uh, there was all these these stories about how all of these things happened. I remember we went on a. Uh, and when I went to Junior Academy, we went on a mission trip to Alaska where we helped with the Iditarod. Uh, we helped with um, doing uh, the different projects for different small schools in Alaska at, at Anchorage and at Palmer and, and all these different places. And uh, on our way down, so if you look at a map of Northern California, uh, we lived in Ukiah and going down to San Francisco is about a three hour drive. And uh, by the time we got to the airport, we're checking in to our airline. We're you know getting our boarding passes and all that. And the the head teacher that was leading the whole group forgot her purse, and she had left it at the school uh, in her classroom that day. And I don't know about you, but it's very difficult to travel without your identification. And so we're like, oh, the, the plane is going to take off in like an hour. There's no way we can you know, drive back. And, then, you know, that's a six hour trip just right there. But we had a driver at the school it was actually the youth pastor. And he was like, I, I'll take it. I'll pick it up and bring it down to you guys. And, and we don't know how fast he was driving, but he must have he doesn't have a fast car. I, I, I've driven with him many times, but we, he, he doesn't have any nice car, but he zoomed down that highway, down 101, to get to San Francisco uh, Airport, and he made it there, and so we don't know how he got there, but we knew that something was, or someone was helping him along the way. What do you do when there's no options available, when everything is dwindling and you have no place to turn? You know, there's something really interesting about studying the different gods of the Old Testament. Uh, and that is that most gods do one of two things. They, and a lot of them, do, do both of these things. And that is they, they perform protection or they provide some kind of service. Right? So you have all these gods in, in the Greek pantheon and the Egyptian line of gods and the Babylonian gods. And most of them do one of these two things. They provide protection or they provide some kind of service. But what's really great about our God is that he goes far and beyond just those two things. Yes, God does provide things. Yes, God does give us protection. But he also wants to see his people become great. He also wants to see his people become great. Now, as you look at the Bible, you notice that God helps people become great. Uh, there's this little boy who, who tends sheep, and God turns that shepherd boy into a giant slaying king. There's this, this girl who loses her parents, so she has to stay with her aunt and uncle, and God turns this little girl into a people-saving queen. There's this Egyptian exile who has to run away because of a murder, and God brings him back to the place of his exile and turns him into into a slave savior. There is this immigrant who travels to Canaan and through his works and the things that he does, he, changed, he changes the landscape of the Middle East forever. You know, what's, what's very interesting about Abraham is that Abraham and his story, the, the pivotal moments in his story does not happen at the beginning when he's called out of Babylon, nor does it happen at the end towards his death, but it happens in the middle of 
his, his story. And that's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning with Abraham in Genesis chapter 22. Uh, you, you know, it's, it's quite remarkable that we might say the middle of Abraham's narrative, his story in Genesis, is when he's way past 100. But that is where his, the, that's where we're going to spend most of our time with Abraham today in Genesis chapter 22. We've been studying the last, uh, last weekend and this week on different names of God. Different names of God, the names of God. Last week we covered Jehovah, or not Jehovah, Yahweh, Nessie. Uh, and we looked at the story of Aaron and Joshua fighting the Amalekites in, in, in Exodus 17. And, uh, and how the Lord is our banner. And today we're going to look at another phrase, another name of God that Abraham gives at, at Mount Moriah. Now, uh, Abraham is promised by God that God is going to give him a son, a promised heir in the form of Isaac. And God says, hey, I'm going to give you as many children. You're becoming your family is going to turn into a big, mighty nation. You're going to have as many as the sands of the what? Sands of the sea and as many stars in the sky. You're going to have so many children that you're going to become the greatest, one of the greatest nations of, of the earth. And God keeps promising this promise, promising this promise, promising this promise. But doubt settles in. And Abraham and Sarah say, you know, it's, it's impossible. We're way past our time to have children. Um, why, don't, why don't we do it our, our own way? Why don't we make it happen our own way? And, of course, we have Ishmael and his, his birth and the affair with, with Hagar. But eventually, God does keep his promise and Isaac is born. Now, if you had been Abraham and Sarah and you had had a miraculous baby like Isaac, how, how would you treat this, this little boy? Would he be special to you or would he just be another one of your relatives? Of course, he would have been special. And I can't imagine how special Abraham must have treated Isaac, his miracle baby his miracle child, how he would have prized him over the flock and the cattle, and how he would have put this, this child on such a high pedestal and cared so deeply for him. But one day, God spoke to Abraham again, and this time it broke his heart. In Genesis chapter 22, in verse uh, uh, 2, we have what God begins to speak to Abraham about. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 2, and he said, And take your son, your only son, who? Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So I, Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him. And his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering, arose, and went to the place of which God had told him. There's a bunch of issues that we have here with the story uh, that Abraham would have had lots of problems with. God, why would you promise me to have a son and then years down the line take that son away? Why would you go to all the work of, 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 of making those promises? And then take that promise away. As, as parents, we know that we don't give our children gifts to take those gifts away. That doesn't seem, you, you want, I mean, uh, usually you want to give a gift for your child and then the next day take that gift away. Actually, I have a personal experience about that. Um, I remember we had a, a Christmas. I don't know if my, my dad's here. I don't know if he remembers this Christmas. But uh, we had a Christmas, and I had really wanted a train set. And I had, there was this big train set. We would go to the store. There was this uh, there was this this toy store. They had in the middle. They had this table. 
you know, they had the, they had the, the whole set. There were these trains that would go, you know, by battery, and you could push different buttons and do all this really cool stuff. And so every time I would say, Mom, Dad, can I have, can I have that train set? And, uh, and they're like, oh, you know, it's, it's, it's really expensive. You know, it's, it's a big thing. I mean, it was the, the highlight of the store, you know, and, well, maybe, maybe one day. And uh, in, in our house, sometimes we would, we would open up a gift on uh, Christmas Eve, right? And so I remember we had opened up a gift, and uh, my mom had said, hey, we're going to open up this, this big one. So we opened up this big this big gift, and it was the train set. We put together the whole thing, and we were having so much fun. We didn't want to go to sleep, my siblings and I, and we just wanted to play at the train set all, all night. And so we, we played at the train set, and eventually it was time to go to sleep. And so with, I'm sure, lots of bribing, we went to bed that night, and uh, hoping to play with it in the morning, right? So we wake up in the morning, and uh, it's not there. The train set's gone. And I'm thinking, wait, 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 hold, where, where did it go? Do you remember? Do you remember the story, Dad, of the train set? No? Okay, well, I remember the, the story of the train set. And we wake up in the morning, I ask my mom, hey, what, what happened to the train set? And she's like, oh, that was, that was, it was a dream of yours. This is a dream. And, but eventually she, she revealed it a little later. But when, when she said it was just a dream, we were so sad. I, said, I was so sad. I don't know about my brother and sister. But I was so sad to have this dream taken away away from me. So why, God, why, why would you promise us, promise my wife and I to have a child, Abraham is, is thinking, and then now you're asking me to sacrifice him, to give him away, to, to, to lose him? I mean, this was a direct, con, a direct conflict with all of the other gods around Abraham. All of those Canaanite gods were involved in child sacrifice. You offer a, a child or you offer a virgin girl and I'll give you rain. I'll, I'll give you food. I'll give you protection. I'll give you sunlight. I'll protect you from your enemies. That child human sacrifice was happening all around Abraham. And that was one of the things that made this God different. Why then are you becoming like one of those other gods. You can imagine as Abraham begins to climb the mountain, as he begins to climb Mount Moriah, the conflict that he has within him. Why would God ask me to do this? And I, I bet that this isn't even God speaking to me. There must be someone else trying to speak to me, to, to sacrifice the promised child that God has given me the child of the promise. But Abraham continues to climb the mountain, and you can imagine as he's climbing, he's looking maybe for a stray animal that he could sacrifice. Maybe there's there's a lamb or a goat or or, or something that we can sacrifice instead of, of Isaac. And he as he climbs, he prays and he's scanning the horizon, looking for something to sacrifice instead of his son. But when we get to verse 7, Genesis 22 and verse 7, we find that Isaac notices that something is amiss, something is different. Genesis 22 and verse 7 says, And Isaac said to his father, Abraham, my father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Behold, the fire and the wood, it's here. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Now notice what Abraham has said. Abraham does not tell Isaac the truth. He does not say, well, we're here because I'm going to put you on the altar. I'm going to sacrifice you. The fire, the wood, it's for you. Abraham doesn't say that. He doesn't say the truth. He doesn't say what God had told him a couple of nights ago. Verse 8. And Abraham said, <clears throat> God will provide for who? For who? <coughs> Excuse me. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. This, this is Abraham's hope. This is not what he's been told. We can say, hey, Abraham is kind of giving a white lie a little bit. Excuse me. <coughs> but instead, he tells Isaac what he is hoping for. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. 
You know, the place that they're at is Mount Moriah. And this is a very important mountain. It's very, it's, its significance is up there with Mount Sinai and the Mount of Olives and uh, some of those other mountains that we find throughout Scripture. Mount Moriah is the place where the, uh, the temple, Solomon's temple, will be built. This is, Jerusalem will, will surround Mount Moriah, will be right there. Jesus will be sacrificed uh, on the cross just a couple of hills away. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. And so as we, as we read that, Abraham says very prophetically that God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. He is looking into the future. In fact, there is a lot of similarities between Isaac and Jesus, right? They are both a child of promise, a child of a miraculous birth. One, both circumstances, their mothers should not have been able to give birth to a child. They both are have, have a father who has to eliminate them. Uh, at their sacrifices, they both have a father who his voice is heard. His voice is heard in the midst of the sacrifice. They both have to carry wood up the mountain. Jesus has to carry his cross, and Isaac carries the wood up to the sacrifice. There is a lot going on. They both go to the same mountain range uh, for their sacrifices. But notice what, what happens after this. You can see the desperation in Abraham's voice. You can hear it as we read it, as he's hoping that there will be a lamb, a ram, something to replace his son. But what happens next is Abraham begins to go ahead with the sacrifice. And we read in verse 10, uh, Genesis 22 and verse 10. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. I've got a question for you this morning. Who killed Jesus? Who killed Jesus? Was it the Jews and the Sanhedrin? Were they the ones who killed Jesus? Who said, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. Give us Barabbas. Was it the Romans who nailed Jesus to, to the cross? Were they the ones who killed Jesus? Who, who killed Jesus? You know, some have, have said, you know, it, it was our sin who, who put Jesus on the cross. I, I think that's true. But it's, I don't think it was our sin that killed Jesus. Was it God himself? Was it the Father who, who killed his son? Who who killed Jesus? Could it be that none of those answers are, are correct? And could it be that there's, there was something else? That it was no one that killed Jesus, but Jesus willingly put himself on the cross. You know what's, what's very interesting, the story of Isaac and Abraham, is that a lot of times when we, we see the story, and we, we hear the story preached, we read the story, we often imagine He's like a seven-year-old boy, nine-year-old boy. The likelihood of that is very, very low. More, more likely than not, Isaac is at the youngest, 18. He's, he's a young man. Uh, Abraham is well into his hundreds. Uh, he's probably getting close to 120, 130. He, he's, he's an old man. The, the, it would have been so easy for Isaac to outmuscle his dad, to run away from his dad, run down the mountain to escape. But instead, what we find is that Isaac trusts his father immensely. That I imagine that Abraham doesn't have to put Isaac on the altar. That Isaac gets up on the altar on his own because of the trust that he has in his father. Amen. Abraham isn't the one that kills Isaac or is going to kill Isaac. Isaac willingly 
submits to his father's will because he trusts the relationship that his father has with God. You see what's happening here? Because Abraham, he, throughout his whole life, he's been walking with God. He walks with God out of Babylon. He walks with God into battle against the five kings. He walks with God out of Egypt. And now Isaac has heard and he has been of his father and he knows the kind of relationship that he has with God. And so he trusts and he willingly puts himself on that altar. But in the midst of Abraham about to become ridiculously obedient, we hear the voice of an angel sent by God himself. Most likely this, it says an angel, uh, but you, you know this, this, this has got to be Jesus himself. Verse 11, but the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. What's, what's really great about this is God, what God can do for Abraham, what he can do for Isaac, he refuses to do for himself. What, let me say it again. What God chooses to do for Abraham and Isaac, he refuses to do for himself. The sacrifice, Abraham and Isaac, their sacrifice is this great parallel to what we find later in the Gospels. And where God tells Abraham to sacrifice this, his son, we find no, no reason outside, outside of that, outside of this blind faith. We find, hey, you committed the sin, so you need to offer a sacrifice. That's not there. We don't find that Isaac is a disobedient boy. He's a disobedient uh, child. You need to discipline him by, by offering up this, his, his life for, for, for a sin sacrifice. There is none of that. It is just go offer yourself for a sacrifice. No reason, no explanation. Just go ahead and do it. And Abraham just walks him and Isaac. They hike up that mountain, and they, they're about to do it. What God, God is willing to do something for Abraham that he's not willing to do for his son. Think about the magnitude of that. There's some things that he's willing to do for you because of his love and care for you far exceeds that of even his son. Not that he doesn't love his son. Not that he doesn't love Jesus. In fact, Scripture talks about different different places like in Psalms. And it says uh, about the relationship between the father and the son. That uh, I delight to be in your presence. I delight to see you work. Talking about creation. How the father and the son, they delight to be with each other. Experiencing the creative process of, of creating the universe. Um, Isaiah talks about as well, I delight to be, I delight to see your, your works of, of your hands. I delight to be in your presence, seeing all the things that you, you do. But God intervenes in Genesis 22. He won't intervene in a much later chapter. But notice something very interesting that Abraham does in verse 14. How does Abraham celebrate that he doesn't that he has a son now. He because before when they're climbing that mountain, he he knows that God is going to take his son. But how does Abraham celebrate that this life is still here? Verse 14. It's the it's, it's this common thread of how people in the Old Testament, how they celebrate when God has done something for them. Remember last week, God Moses celebrated when they were victorious over the Amalekites by naming the altar. Do you remember what they named the altar? What Moses named the altar last week? Yahweh. Yahweh Nessi, which means the Lord is my banner. Meaning my, my identity does not fall into my political standing. It does not reside in my nationality. It is not, it's not found in the flag that I put up on on at my house but my identity lies in my allegiance to Jesus that I am a Christian far before I am anything else that I 
I pledge allegiance to Jesus before I pledge allegiance to the flag. I honor Jesus before I honor my political worldview, right? The Lord is my banner, not, uh, you know, not like Biden or Trump or anyone else is my banner, but, but God is my banner. Abraham does something very, very similar here in Genesis 22 and verse 14. It says, so Abraham called the name of that place. He gives it a name and he says, the Lord will provide. Now notice, because this is written during Moses' time, and he gives his own little footnote, and he says, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Meaning, when Moses comes to Mount Moriah, many, many, many years later, they still call it the same thing. The Lord will provide. Not that the Lord has provided, but he will, meaning future tense, he's going to provide again. So when they come to this mountain, you know, names are really important because when we come to different places, uh, we might name it something to remind us of what happened there, right? When, when Jacob travels through the wilderness and he has an experience of God, he names it Bethel, which means house or tent of the Lord, because this was the God's encampment. I was with God in this place. So he names it Bethel, the, the house of the of God. Abraham does something very similar here, and he, he calls it Yahweh Jireh, meaning the Lord will provide. He's, he climbs this mountain. There's no options for the sacrifice. There's not a goat. There's not a lamb. There's not a ram. There's not a, a turtle. There is nothing around to sacrifice in place of his son. He can't find a single thing. All He knows that the only option left is to sacrifice his son. And it's the last thing that he wants to do. This is the promise that God had given him when Sarah was giggling, hearing about this prophecy many, many years later. The angel said, why, are you, why are, you, are you laughing? In fact, we named our son after that incident because my wife was laughing. And Isaac means, means laughter. And Abraham decides, we're going to name this place the Lord will Provide. So every time we come up to this mountain, every time we pass this mountain, we are reminded that God provides. And generations afterward are going to re re be reminded that God not only has provided in the past, but he will provide in the future. How many of you are, are tired today? Amen. How many of you are, are exhausted? You're, you're, you're tired, right? Yeah. God can provide you with some more energy. How many of you are a little bit sad about what's going on and maybe in your life or in the life of someone you know or just you hear things on, on news? Yes. You're just like, oh. you, I, I go to the, the uh, uh, Planet Fitness uh, from like Monday to Friday every morning. I go there early in the morning and they got all these TVs, right? Um, right in front of the, uh, the treadmills. And they have like, you know, like, I don't know, it's like 50. 20 TVs all across there and they got each, each one is a different uh, news station or a TV show or something and uh, I often will bring my phone and, and put it down so I don't have to look at the TVs because uh, you don't want to start your day off with a lot of yeah. negativity uh, when, you're, when you're trying to exercise and uh, but yeah it is, you see all these different TV uh, these news stations and they'll talk about um, you know, all these terrible things happening around, around the world. Um, you know, when it comes to churches, our biggest threats are not people from outside of the church. Our biggest threat is not the, the Pope. Our biggest threat is, is not the, the Baptists or the, the Latter-day Saints down the road. Our biggest threat isn't secularism and, and the movie theater. Often, the biggest threats in churches... Are internal. Uh, people come in, inside into the church. They bring ideas that are conflicting, and people inward fighting, and they're they're focused more on themselves and other people than the mission of the church. And so the church can't grow, and they can't do things. It's often internal struggle. What do we do when we are we're having an internal struggle? What do, what do we what do we turn to? There's there's this phrase that pops up over and over again, and you you've already heard it already today. Yahweh Jireh, it's a name 
the Lord will provide. We hear lots of things about food shortages and, um, and, and you know, prophecy talks about how there's going to be a time when we can't buy or sell. What are you going to do when you can't buy or sell? Are you going to stock up? You're going to spend all your money and stock up on all this, all this kind of things? You can stock up all you want. There's going to come a time when you run out. There's going to come a time where we, we, we run out of things, we run out of possessions, where there's going to come a time where they come looking for, for people. We know in the great controversy, as well as Revelation and, and, and prophecy and Daniel, that there's going to be persecution. In fact, persecution promotes growth. Did you know that? Persecution promotes growth. And then persecution is important to church growth. Um, but, but what are we going to do when we become persecuted. We've heard things about, um, you know, going to the hills and becoming self-sufficient. Uh, even if you destroy your cell phone, you are still trackable. Even if you give off heat, you are trackable. Uh, you give off a heat signature, you are, you are trackable. It's not whether, in order to survive those, those times, it's not whether or not we are self-sufficient. It's not about whether or not we have isolated ourselves far enough from society that we can survive. You will be tracked. You will be able to be found. But do you know what is going to separate our ability to succumb to when they, they say, hey, I want you to deny Jesus. I want to, you to deny your faith. How, how, are, how are we going to be able to stand during those times when we can't buy or sell, when we can't, when there's no food around, when we don't have a home, when we're, when we're being chased around like the Waldenses many, many years ago? How will we be able to survive all or any of that, if at all? The Lord will provide. The Lord, Lord will provide. There's, there's this phrase that, that Abraham names this mountain and he continues this to be his provide, his, his, his mantra throughout the, his whole experience. And that is that not only has the Lord provided in the past, but he is going to continue to provide in the future. When Abraham goes and he marches against these five kings, he is not dependent on his ability as a warrior. Abraham is not a warrior in any sense of the word, but he depends on God's strength because God can provide not just funds, not just a place to live, but he can provide strength. He can provide lots of, lots of different things. And so when, when we are pressured, when we are tortured, when we need protection, when we need food, when we need all of these things, we can go back and remember that the story of Abraham, that the Lord provided for him, so he will provide for me. But there's another aspect to this, and that is Abraham did not just believe that God would provide in that moment, in that moment oh, I'm going, to, I'm going to name this place, this mountain, the Lord will provide. That his faith was built over time. His faith, his trust, that's what faith is, it's trust, was built over time. So, you know, a great, great example of this is uh, the story of Job. Job chapter 1, verse, it opens up with, there was a man of Job who lived in the land of Uz, and it says that he was blameless and he was upright, the most in all of the east, in all, all the whole land, that this was the guy, right? But the story does not open up when he was born. The story opens up when he has lots of land, when he has lots of cattle, he's got lots of kids, and his kids are growing up living in their own houses. So that tells us that lots of time has passed when we meet Job. Job was not born righteous and blameless and, and, and upright and holy. He yeah. built that up over a long course of time. So guess what? We can't go into the last days and expect to be like, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. I go to church on Saturday. God's going to be going to be with me. Yes, he will. But there's another aspect to that, and that is your habits that you have built up over a course of time. The 
book of Revelation ends with this phrase, those who are righteous will be what? Righteous still. And those who are wicked will be? Wicked still. Why are, they, why are the righteous righteous still? Why are the wicked wicked still? It's because they have built up a pattern in their life of habits, choices turn into habits, habits turn into routines, of choosing to either be wicked or be righteous. And guess what? There is a once you have gone really deep into your your pattern or your, your choices in life, there is little that other outside forces can deter you, right? So most of us are some of the in this in this room. If someone comes and let's say a, a member of the the, the uh, United Methodist Church come over and they knock on your door and they say, "Hey, I I want to give you a Bible study and get you baptized today." What is the likelihood of you saying, all right, let's do it. I'm on board. Let's, let's do it. Or let's say, hey, I want, come, come to my church this Sunday. What is the likelihood of you going to their church that Sunday? Or let's make it even simpler. Hey, I got a Bible study. And, and we're, we're studying about, the, the, about hell. We're studying about the, uh, the, the secret rapture. What is the likelihood of you attending that Bible study without an agenda to convince everyone on your beliefs. Very low, right? Because we have built up a series of choices and habits that has now ingrained into us. This is why old, if you want to uh, convert someone, if they're really old or if they've been in a church for a very long time, it's very difficult because those habits have been built up over the course of 10, 20, 15, 30 years. So if we have built up habits and choices to choose God or choosing self, to choose love instead of choosing sin, then number one, it becomes very easy for God to work in our life because we have that connection and foundation. But it is also very difficult for the enemy to attack us. And it becomes much, much more clear when we read in Revelation, those who are righteous will continue to be righteous and those who are wicked will continue to be wicked. Because it doesn't matter what God says or does in that person's life at that point, because they have made multiple series of choices to be wicked, to choose something else that God can say, he can do something, he can perform miracles, and it wouldn't matter because they would continue to choose wickedness, right? So we got two things here. And that is, number one, God has made a promise. Yahweh Jireh is not just a name. It is a reminder and a promise that God will provide. Not only that, but we also have to remember about our own choices, our own actions. And we must act as if that promise is a reality. We must act and live as if that promise is a reality. That does not mean like I'm, I'm, if the disaster is coming, I'm not going to prepare for it. It means I prepare for it, but I also trust that if everything goes wrong, God is going to provide. I, I, as we come to a close, I just want to share um, a little story what happened this last week. So uh, some of you might know that this last week, Ashley went to a convention in uh, Dallas. Their, her work has a work convention uh, once a year, and this was their 10th anniversary. So they went, they go down there, and Ashley's the only one that, or one of the few that works from home, and so she has to go down there to Dallas. And they haven't had it for a number of years because of, of COVID and different things. They, it's been like three or four years since they've, they've had it. And so I actually was very stressed out about going to, to this convention, traveling to, to Dallas by herself. She'd be away from me and be away from Amaya. And um, she would have to get on a plane by herself and she'd have to get an Uber driver. And, you know, and we were really stressed out about all the things that could happen, right? All these things that, that could happen happen and um, we had to sit down and just talk talk about all this stuff and um, all these possibilities about these things that that could happen who who is she gonna get in a car with who knows what, what kind of person is this gonna be is they gonna take her off somewhere and never see her again 
Um, what's going to happen to the plane? Is there going to be an accident on the plane? Is the lightning going to strike it? It's going to fall out of the sky? Who, who knows? So all these things could happen. But what was really great is that the end of her trip, she had a wonderful time, uh, had, had really great Uber drivers, and uh, she uh, had great conversations with coworkers that, that she works with. And uh, God provided every, every step of the way. And, and we had, she had a really, really, really great time. But she did not sit back and say, well, God's going to provide, so I'm not going to buy, buy a plane ticket. So I'm not going to schedule a driver to come pick me up. So I'm not going to pack clothes for the trip. There's things that she had to do on her own, yes. Yes. but still trusting and believing that God would provide on her trip. So, you know, hey, you know, there's, our world is scary, and there's, there's a good reason that it's scary. It's not because there's an absence of God, but because there is a presence of someone else. But in the midst of the darkness, there's also, also a light. So I don't know what, what's, what you're going on here in your life, but I'd like to pray with you um, and, and offer a special prayer for you this morning. Uh, let's, let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, uh, I know that there might be people in, in this room, in this building, who need for you to provide something in their life. And if there is, I want to encourage them to just, just put up a hand. Our eyes are closed. We're, we're not looking at anyone. And if you need some sort of way for God to provide something in your life, put your hand up in the air and say, and, and say in your heart, God, I need you to provide this, whether it's, it's funds, whether it's, it's rest, whether it's, um, it's protection, whether it is uh, guidance, whether it is anything. Father, we have an opportunity to call out to you, to call out to your name that reminds us that you are the God who provides. You don't just protect us. You just don't want great things to happen to us. You don't just have great plans for us, but you actively provide in our life. And we can proclaim that you are Yahweh Jireh. Father, we want to use this opportunity to seek you and to take some time to ask you for something specific. And so I want to give us just a few moments for you giving an opportunity to, to this, this morning to pray and say, Lord, I need this. Lord, you have promised me that you will provide for me, so I need this in my life. So I want to give you a couple moments, say a little prayer. Father, Lord, I need this in my life. Father, we're, we're thankful that you are not a God who has run out of resources. That you're not a God who has a bank, a bank account that, has, that runs at zero. But that anything that you, you need, that you can say, and it comes into existence. Father, we, we know that in your word it says that you are a generous God and that you are looking forward to, to give gifts, to give the things that we need. And so, Father, um, we want to, to, to say that we, we are going to hold you accountable to, to what you have promised to us. And we want to, to be, be regarded as your people and to be faithful so that when you do give us things, that we can say, this has happened not because I have an amazing prayer life, not because I am something special, not because I'm a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but because this is the outpouring of the love of God and that we can share these stories and people can be reminded of your love and your goodness and your greatness because you love and care for those who are faithful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.